Hi everybody. My family, how are you? Waiting a few minutes for you to um, join on um, and watch. We got an important message today. So I'm just kind of hanging out here, waiting for you to come on board. Hey Bob, how are you? Pam, good to see you. Rosemary, how is things in Delaware over there? We so miss you. Marge, good to see you too. Waiting for a few more to get on. Um, just so we got an important message today. Hey Joni, how are you? Maria, oh my goodness, so good to see you for sure. Thanks so much, Pam. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Kathleen, Kathy Costa, amen. Hey, Rosemary, Steve, good to see you too. We're used to being together at our gatherings and obviously that's not happening in this season, but it's really good to be together. Everything's good in Delaware, Rosemary. I'm glad to see that. Keep those hearts coming. Leah, hey, up in upper New Jersey there. And Maria, thank you for your congratulations. Doris, hey. Oh, I'm looking at all of you pop on. That is just so wonderful. Just let me give you another second. Ruth's coming on, lots coming on right now. I just want to give it a few seconds here and uh, wait till some more of you are on because I'm so excited about our message today. That's for sure. Jeanette, hey, how are you? Hope you're feeling better. Carol, good to see you too. You're right there with uh, Jeanette, so that's great. And um, Eileen, hey, how are you? We miss you in Bible study every week. It's good to talk to you. Um, all right, I'm gonna wait for two more, I think, and then we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, but Joni, thank you for your congratulations. Thank you for all those hearts and love. I so appreciate that. Waiting just for a few more of you to gather on. All right. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and go. First of all, it's so good to see you, Barb Evans. Been praying for you, my lady. How are you doing? I believing for uh, just a touch from the Lord for you. That's for sure. And Ruth, thank you so much. Um, just so good to be with you today. Thank you for waiting a day. Usually we get together on Tuesdays at two o'clock, but as you know, we had a little something, something take place and we're just so happy about it. But it's really good to be with you today. I hope you're doing well, uh, body, soul, and spirit. I want you to know, um, Doris, good to see you. I pray for you every day. Oh my goodness, every week that goes by, I just miss you so much and just have been receiving your text messages and whatnot on how much you're missing things too. Um, just our getting together is just ah, so messed, so messed. But you know what? We're getting closer and closer to being able to do that again. So I'm just so thankful also that while we're apart, I'll tell you one of the good things through this is that some of some old friends, um, you know, from years ago, even old Bible studies from, you know, 15 years ago, um, are, you know, listening in and joining us. And that, that is just a really, really wonderful thing. I'm so glad to be able to connect, um, and have you join our FaceTime live family and our faith school family, I should say. Um, so that's really wonderful that we've actually, been able to hear the word a little stronger than even the so many that you that gather on Tuesday and Tuesday morning and Tuesday night. Well, um, I guess some of you know that we postponed yesterday's message because we had a very humongous, amazing blessing um, that came into our lives very early on Tuesday morning. At our grand sugar um, I like to call them and have for a long time, was born in Florida, Adam and Missy. It's their first baby. Her name is Davy Love. Davy Love. Um, and, and it's interesting. It's a, it's a um, female gender from the word David. So Davy and David both mean um, beloved. 
And let me tell you, she is already living up furiously to her name because we just cannot wait to get our hands on that little bundle of joy. Well, she's a sweet, pudgy-cheeked beauty. Um, you may have seen her. I posted on Facebook this morning. I, I was a little bit tarrying to put that up because I wanted Adam and Missy to go ahead and, you know, announce that first and whatnot. So I wanted to not rush right into that, although I was right at the right at the start line, I have to tell you, but she was eight pounds, seven ounces, and 20 and a half inches, which we're just so astonished by because Melissa's like five foot two and weighs all of 115 pounds probably. So this little pudgy cheeked, amazing girl, oh gosh, it's just uh, certainly keeping in line with, you know, the abundant living that we're supposed to have. But um, as you can imagine, we are madly in love with her and just cannot wait to desperately get to Florida and hold this little blessing from the Lord in our very own arms. But she had 24 hours of labor, just about. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to our son-in-law, Adam. He was just so sweet and so kind and so patient. Not only did he never leave her side the entire time, but he had a deal with his uh, his mother-in-law here in New Jersey. So um, just love him and they just uh, have a great family and a life. And we're just thrilled that um, they're starting this new transition in their life and we just can't wait to get there. But, um, you know, it's so funny with all of this, the 24 hours and I'm here and we're not there. And, you know, of course, as a mom, you're concerned what's going on and whatnot. I don't know if you're sensing this in this season, but... The Lord just seems to be giving us reason upon reason to just trust him a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Does anybody know what I'm saying? It just seems like everywhere I look, there's just this element of him calling us closer to come away with him and just trust him more and more and more and more. So uh, thank you for your texts. Thank you for your inboxes and your message. And my goodness, especially your prayers. Um, your prayers were answered when we saw our little Davy. Um, we're just so excited and we just can't wait to get with her. So welcome to all of you. I'm seeing a few that have joined a little late. So welcome to you. And um, I just want you to know that we post these messages on our website, covenantmessiah.com. You can go right on over to the media section and you will see that all every single message in its entirety is posted. So if you came on a little late, you can go ahead and jump on and, and you know, on the website and hear that. We also um, have a, our own YouTube channel called Covenant Messiah Church. And if you go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube page, you can also not just only hear it, but you'll see um, the Facebook Live that we've done there. So if you joined a little late, a welcome to you. Jean Buss, hey there. How are you, my friend? Good to have you from old Lancaster. What is Lancaster doing without those buffets? I'll tell you, as soon as they open, Jean, can you please let me know that? Because Miller's is calling my name. As is so many other things, as you know, what is there? We're, we're just spending our time cooking. I have not cooked this much. I cannot tell you when, but welcome to each and every one of you. Um, before we get started today, I just want to really send out an earnest, um, just desire to let you know that I'm here for you. If there's a need you have, if there's something that I can either do or put you in the right direction to help you along this, you know, this path that we're on, please, please do not hesitate to let me know that. Um, before you even ask, I pray for you every day, our, our faith school family and our covenant Messiah family. But if there's something specific that you want me to pray for, either inbox me, email us, or go ahead and put it in the comments and I will be happy to do that. So last time we were together, we looked um, on verses 12 through 16 in Luke chapter 6. Um, we read about the 12 that Jesus chose. In fact, the number 12 means government. Uh, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Because he chose those beginning 12, which would institute the government of the kingdom of God coming in um, to the earth. Um, within all that we talked about, we honed in on a couple things that I just kind of want to review a little bit. 
um, we, we observed, and I have often observed, the stages of discipleship. And we actually see that even in the calling, and we're going to go in even deeper in that today. Remember that we said the first calling is the call to become born again. Um, I pray that if you're online today and you don't know for sure that uh, you're going to go to heaven someday or that you have eternal life, boy, the Lord wants us to know that. In fact, his word tells us in uh, John's epistle, he said, I write these things so that you may know you have eternal life. You know, often denominational churches are having us do a lot of works and whatnot, hoping it'll be sufficient hoping those good things will outweigh the bad and that God will mark on a curve. And now he's writing all that we're learning in the Gospel of Luke and other places in the Bible, writing these things so that we may know that we have eternal life. He wants us to know it. He wants us to have that assurance. So the very first thing we need to step into is the call to be born again. Um, the second thing is we enter into service and sometimes that happens right away or sometimes there's a season. It's maybe getting involved in a church and um, maybe something from the pulpit comes out as an offer to serve. And But that's important. That's so important um, to, to be, be a part of our, our maturity as we grow in Christ. So not just being born again, but to serve. And then out of that, maturity will come maturity is developed which then leads to a calling it leads to ascending it leads to the realization of our purpose and our destiny and you know we said last week there are no shortcuts to that end game it it, it comes when all the other ingredients are in place so you've heard me say this so often I, i'm going to repeat it i think it's worth reminding myself and yourself too that we all are born again with gifts. When we're born again, the Lord downloads not only the gifts uh, or the fruit of the Spirit, but he, he, he has gifts in mind for us. They're all uh, put together based on how he's made us, our personalities and whatnot. But those gifts are without reproach, Roman tells us. In other words, if you mess up and you don't maybe walk in those, he doesn't pull those gifts back. Those gifts are part of what... He puts inside of us, they're infused in us, like an IV line would be infused in us at the time of salvation. But don't be confused. Your gifts will take you somewhere. Often that's the thing that does take you somewhere is a pastor, a five-fold ministry gifted person will see a, a, a gifting within you and they'll call you and ask you to serve in a certain place. But the gifts maybe are the entrance points, maybe into ministry or into a local church or whatnot, but that's not what keeps you in the place. Character is what keeps you there. Maturity is what keeps you there. And that's the end part, not just to get saved, not just to serve, but to mature, to mature in that place. And, and we, we can see in this narrative that when we, we noted Judas, Judas, we talked about him last week. Um, it, it gave us a description of Judas's character. And in Luke, it says that he became a traitor. Wow. I mean, how would you like to have that attached to your name? Matthew also says he was a betrayer. Mark also says he was a betrayer to his leader. I, I find that so interesting that Judas is always mentioned last. Whenever we go to the description and the calling of the 12, we always see Peter first. We mentioned that last week, and we always see Judas listed last. Um, what, what, why does that mean? I, I love what Luke says. Don't miss this. Luke says he became a traitor. He became a traitor, which means he didn't start out as a betrayer, but he became that. Why? Why did it? What, what, why is that necessary for maybe the Holy Spirit to, to allow us to see that became word? It's an important word. I'm so glad you asked. I am so, so glad you asked because somewhere along the progression of the list of things to get called out and to walk in our purpose and to walk in our destiny, somewhere Judas stopped growing. Pride came in selfish desires, 
uh, abilities and his own giftings rather than the one who gave the gifting. Listen, Peter is right. You know, the epistle of Peter, he says, pride always comes before a fall. And you know what happened? That's exactly what happened. Judas did fall and he was replaced. He was replaced with Matthias. And, and I'm so thankful. I hope that you are too, that, that often, most of the time, praise God, um, God gives us grace to do do-overs. I like to call them do-overs. We get to start again and we get to do over and he graces us with that. But I do want you, my, my beloved brothers and sisters, I want you to keep in mind that not every time do we get to have a do-over. Not every time. Sometimes we don't get to do it over. Instead, God will replace us. God will move on to the next person waiting in line or or his maybe not his first. You know, God always has a plan A. He's never nothing ever stumps him. But because we're why? Why why is that? Because we're gonna do it God's way, or we're gonna do it God's way. But I once heard somebody say, but we are gonna do it God's way. Now see if we were out in drive in church on Sundays, this would be the time that you would be honking your horn, right? Because we are gonna do it God's way. And whether we don't go through the process and the crucible of discipleship, if we don't want to do that, we don't have to do it. The Lord always has somebody who will do his work. And my prayer before we even go into our time today is that you won't let that opportunity pass by you. In fact, let's pray. Father, before we open your word right now and begin to review this and look at the names and the faces that you chose, Jesus. They weren't ones we would choose. They're certainly not ones that corporate America would pick to be the second in charge of the CEO. But I pray, Lord God, that we would see, as we had mentioned before, that you do not pick us and choose us based on necessarily who we are right now, but you see beyond that. You see who you desire us to become because Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future and not to harm you. Lord, but you also call us to be part of that plan. You call us to walk into the waters of salvation the wells of salvation, if you will, and then to serve you in those wells. And then as we serve you, our flesh has to die. We have to crucify this flesh as we work with one another. We're going to see in these verses, Lord, that you paired two and two up and you sent them out two at a time. And often you put those two together who were very different from one another. So Father, help us to see diversity is your plan. But help us also to see that we need to go from glory to glory and faith to faith. And we need to go along with the plan and the process of discipleship so that we end up not just serving you out of fleshly desires, out of positions and titles, but that we serve you to mature ourselves and that Christ can be formed in us so that we can love and live just like him more and more. So as we open up this lesson today, Father, I pray a corporate blessing upon our word today that, that we would corporately go further in you as your church. We would all catch the obvious, but I pray a rhema. I pray a rhema on all of us individually that we will hear exactly what Holy Spirit you desire us to hear, to tailor us and groom us and transform us and renew our minds so that we can indeed, even this day, go from the glory we're in to the glory that you, Holy Spirit, you, Jesus, who died for us, and God, our Father, who loves us and provided all that we need, we lift all this up to you and this message to you. Hide me under your wing, Holy Spirit. Be the teacher of the church. And the church of God said, amen. Okay, well, let's start rereading in Luke 6, chapter, I mean, chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. And we read this last week, but let's remind ourselves. In those days, Jesus went out to the mountain and he prayed continually all night. He prayed to God. And when it was day, he called for his disciples. Hey, I don't want to get detoured here, but 
Our prayer always should lead us somewhere. When we pray, God should direct us somewhere. We shouldn't just pray to pray. We pray to hear. We pray to be moved. We pray so that we know the kingdom's mandate uh, for the season and the day and the time and the moment that we're in. And such was the case of Jesus. He prayed all night. And then when it was day, there was an implementation to the spiritual discipline of prayer that he had. And what was it? He called. He did. He moved. He reacted and responded and reacted to what was the response of that prayer. And he called his disciples. And of them, he chose these, which means there was more than 12, right? He chose them. He, and he not only chose them, he named them apostles. Again, with maturity is going to come a calling. Simon, who was named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas. Do you see the coupling, how Jesus is putting them together? Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Let's look at this a little bit. Um, I want to take some of them apart. I want to give you a little, little understanding of who these ordinary guys were. Hey, they were blue collar workers. They were fishermen. They were average guys. There was no big shots in the group. But you know what? When we give the Lord what we have, he makes much of it, doesn't he? So I'm giving you the end before we even get there. So let's talk about Peter. Peter, what an amazing guy. I mean, when I think of Peter, the first thing that comes to my mind is, really? Really, Peter? I mean, this guy was a piece of work. I mean, this guy, not only, he's the only one who tried to straighten Jesus out. I mean, he's the only one who literally rebuked the Messiah about going to the cross. He said, no, Lord, Lord, you, know that you can never do this. This can't be for you. And also, Peter is the only one that Jesus personally rebuked back and said what? Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block. And you know what else he said? Your mind is on flesh and it's not on spirit. Listen, this Peter that we say, really, Peter? This is the guy who will deny Christ not once, but he will do it three times. And while he's doing it, he will curse to get his point across at those that are saying he's one of her, Jesus' followers. God will have to bring down not once, not twice, but three times we read in the book of Acts that God will need to bring down a sheet to teach Peter about grace before he will actually get it. Paul will rebuke him at the church of Antioch because of his lack of faith. Wow. Are, are you a Peter? A am I a Peter? Can any of us relate to Peter here as we look at it? Simon was his name. Peter, he was the rock. We're talking about Rocky here. And, and guess what? With all that took place and all he did, yet Jesus prayed all night and Peter was chosen. Listen, Peter will end up saying this. I'd like to read it to you in his own epistle, 2 Peter 3, and in verse 17, he will say this, 2 Peter 3, 17, you therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own firm footing, being led away by the deception of the wicked one. But instead, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the same Peter. See, he didn't start out so great, but when Jesus called his 12, he didn't necessarily look at their giftings at the time. He looked at their potential. He looked at the callings and the purposes and the destinies that he had established for them, and each one of them was different. It's amazing. It's just an absolute amazing to me because as a mess, that he would be quite the man. Chain to, listen, this guy is the only one who preached to a, a congregation of 3,000 people got saved in Jerusalem, in the center of Jerusalem, 3,000. That just is amazing to me. Yet he had this 
description and character traits and and in, in vacillatings back and forth, uh, depending on the season and the time he would be in. I mean, truly, he was a mess, but he would become quite the man, quite the man. His ending would be that he'd be chained to a pole. I, I want you to hear this. Chained to a pole in the maritime prison in Rome for nine months. And he wasn't chained to a pole where he could lay down. He was chained to a pole, tradition tells us, in such a way that the whole time he did not sleep. Stood for literally nine months. And if that wasn't enough torture, then when they went out to crucify him, they didn't crucify him first. They took his wife out first. Yes, to those that maybe have a Roman Catholic background, Peter did have a wife. In fact, uh, the book tells us in Luke that he had a mother-in-law that was healed by Jesus, but they took, the Romans took out his wife and made him watch the crucifixion of his very wife. And then when it came his turn, his last request was that he would, was not worthy to be crucified the way his Lord was. And so they crucified him upside down. I mean, can you imagine going through nine months of what he went through, the persecution prior to that, the arrest and the probable um, stockyard um, beatings and whatnot and watching his own wife just tortured and yet he still had his mind and his heart on the Lord. My goodness, it wasn't on him. He didn't say poor me and blame everybody else for what was going on. He had his mind on Christ so much that he didn't find himself worthy to even suffer the way that Jesus suffered. And so they literally crucified Peter upside down. And yet tradition tells us that he led some 40 something Roman soldiers to Christ in the middle of his quarantine suffering. Hmm. Peter, impetuous Peter, he truly did become rocky, didn't he? He truly did become a rock. And you know what Peter, you know what Peter was prayed for? You know, we don't know what Jesus prayed for. He prayed for the calling of the 12, but Jesus is the great mediator between God and man, and he's constantly interceding on our behalf and I, I was wondering as I was preparing for this message that one of the things I know that Jesus prayed for for Peter he prayed this and it's found if you have your Bibles if you look at John 21 uh, verses 18 John 21 verse 18 and it says this the end of the last chapter of John and it says this is after Peter had you know deny Jesus three times and Jesus has now been resurrected and he's he's out and he's ministering and he's showing himself to some of the followers of Jesus showed himself to 500 plus people after his very resurrection and of course some of them were the apostles and it's so interesting it's it's said that for the three times that he denied Jesus Jesus restored him for each one of those and finally, the third time, Jesus says, if you love me, feed my sheep. And then verse 18 says, truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus' words to Peter, when you were young, you dressed yourself and you walked around like you desired. See, that's the mark of an early Christian experience. You know, we, we don't, we're not disciplined. We're not mature. We kind of do what we want. and We let everybody else pay for what we want to do. But he's saying when you're young, when you're immature, you dress yourself and you walk around like you desire. But when you're old, in other words, when you're matured, listen to this church, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to Peter, signifying the kind of death that would glorify God. And when he said this to Peter, he said, follow me, follow me. You know, Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden's light, but the longer we follow Christ, it requires more maturity. Not gifts, but character. 
That's what's required to go deeper and higher in the Lord. And that was what I believe part of the continual prayer that Jesus had for Peter. At one point we read, he said, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, Peter. But I'm praying, I'm praying for you that your faith would sustain you through whatever has to sustain you. We, they're, they're, see, we, we, want, we want all the, the show time, but do we want the prayer of Jesus to just sustain us through this time? Boy, I can't think of any better portion of scripture to just talk about that right now. You know, we want breakthroughs and we want this to get over and we want this to move on. Listen, me too, I'm right with you. But maybe we just have to have the confidence that Jesus is praying for us. That as Satan is sifting this world, that Jesus Christ, the intercessor between God and man, is praying that our faith is going to sustain us. Well, Peter was the first one mentioned, but there was somebody else. Andrew. Andrew is the younger brother of Peter. He has no book written in his name. None whatsoever. Um, yet, he's the one, if you will, that introduces Peter himself to Jesus. And he's a quiet one, very different than Peter. He's a thoughtful one. He's a quiet one. He's a, probably an introvert, um, didn't have to be front and center all the time with his opinion of how everybody should do things. Um, he had a quiet strength. You know, I think when I think about Andrew, I think about Moses. Moses was a leader that was very meek. God uses all kinds of people for leadership. When they get to that mature place, he can use us. And I just pitch out to you, are you a Peter? Maybe you're an Andrew. Andrew also was crucified for Christ also. Then we come across in this list of 12, Two other, James and John, I know you've heard about them. Um, if you were Jesus, would you have picked James and John? I mean, James, let me just say, was the first martyr. When we studied the book of Acts, we learned that. Um, he was beheaded, Acts tells us. Um, we always, however, picture John as this loving one. In fact, he's called the beloved, right? The beloved one of Christ. Always picture him resting on the bosom of Jesus. But you know what? We know more than just that. We know that these two were very denominational. It was us four and no more. What do I mean by that? Well, one day they told Jesus, we saw someone casting out demons. And you know what? They didn't use your name. So we stopped them, Jesus. And we told them, if you're not in our group, you can't do that. They were a very denominational group. And they would also go to Samaria stop there Jesus would have them go there on their way to Jerusalem and they would literally call down fire they asked Jesus to call down fire against the Samaritans you know send your holy smoke Jesus listen these two James and John they were firemen before there were firemen right and they also wanted to ask permission and they went to Jesus and said we're going to ask you a question but say yes before we ask you are you, are you a James and a John? Um, they, they wanted to sit on the right and the left hand of Jesus. And of course, their mother was involved with asking that question. And they did that because they, they wanted to hurry up and get that position before someone else got the position. These are the leaders of the first church. We're interested in their position and their title and who's closest to the leader and who gets that kind of approval and whatnot going on. Church, this is what was in these guys, okay? Selfish, self-centered, impulsive, uncaring. Listen, they didn't care that there were women and children and babies and the poor and the needy and Samaritan. Just call down the fire because listen, it's about us and our group. Am I? Are you? What kind of qualities are in us that describe us to be a James and a John? And yet, you know what Jesus does? Jesus calls them the sons of thunder. Can, can, can you even imagine the, the, the talk in the group at that time? 
oh, here they come, the firemen. Yet, you know what? What's interesting to know is John will do great things in Samaria, the very place he wanted to call down fire and have Jesus really kill them all. He'll lead a revival. There'll be multitudes that'll be saved with signs and wonders that will come in the midst of that. Yet James will, will be the first martyred, this, this duo. James will be the first martyred, but John will never be martyred. John will go on to and die of what we believe is natural causes, old age. He'll go on to write his own gospel. He'll write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the epistles, and he'll write a book that we have yet to see the fullness um, manifest, the book of Revelation. And he will write that while he is exiled in a island called Patmos over in the Mediterranean. Um, and you know, it's tradition tells us that they tried to scald him in hot oil. They tried so hard to kill John from every way they could think of, and yet he would not die. And I often am, am brought to remembrance when we studied the book of Revelation because he is known as the apostle of love and love never dies. Isn't that interesting how we can put uh, those scenarios together? We've yet to see that book of Revelation unfold in its entirety. However, I believe we're, we're right there at the beginnings of it. And certainly when you look at the, the seven churches in the first couple chapters, we see that it dictates and, and shows us the stages and phases of all of church history. Someday I'm going to go back and teach that again. But continuing on where we are in verses 12 through 16, we see Philip and Bartholomew. Now, before I go any further, this is so interesting because, you know, many of you, if you're like me, when I first got revelation on this, I realized Luke is not listed as a disciple, yet there's a gospel. Mark is not listed, yes. Some of well, who we think are these 12, it turns out, aren't. And some of them go on through the ages and they have their own books and, and we have church doctrine based on some of the epistles that are written, but some we really don't ever hear about again. And so we look at Philip. Philip's a people person. Philip's an extrovert. Philip loves to bring people to Jesus. He's an, he's an evangelist. There's no doubt about it. In fact, he brought a bunch of Greeks to Jesus. In fact, he's the one who brought Nathaniel to Jesus. We read that in John 1. And so I ask, are you, are you, a, are you a Philip? Is that, is that what God has placed in you in giftings? Are you a Philip? Bartholomew, and in other, um, maybe other translations, you may see that his alternate name was Nathaniel. And we know from, from some narrative in scripture that Nathaniel's a loner. He's the opposite. He's an introvert. Notice the coupling. God, Jesus seems to be putting them out two by two as they will eventually go out and preach the gospel. And he puts the opposites together. Oh, I hate when that happens, don't you? The opposites. We see Philip, the evangelist, he's, he's out there. He's just an extrovert and a people person. And he just can't, he don't want to be by himself. And then we see Nathaniel as a loner. He's a thinker. In fact, we read that Jesus will see him sitting under a fig tree. And yet they'll serve together. Jesus said this of Nathaniel. He said, he's an Israelite and I find no deceit in him. Wow, what a statement. Before he met Christ, though, I have to tell you, Nathaniel was a racist. Wow. Saying what? He's the one who said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Very prejudiced. Very opinionated in what he see and what he would see in the natural. And so I think we need to ask ourselves, are we a Nathaniel? Is there something in us that's a Nathaniel? Nathaniel would be decapitated and imagine he was skinned alive before he was crucified. Then we come to two interesting characters, Thomas and Matthew. Thomas, as we know, is often known. He has this little character trait known as the Doubting Thomas. 
Um, because why? Because after the resurrection, the appearance of Christ to the others, and they went and told Thomas, he said that unless he sees the hand, the crucified, pierced hand of Jesus, and actually put his hands in those pierced hands, that he would not believe. Are you a Thomas? Are you someone that you will not believe the word of God or the things of God or maybe what's spoken at pulpits or messages that you hear unless you have a personal experience yourself with it? I think all of us can relate to that a little bit. Thomas refused to believe with that personal experience himself. Are you a Thomas? Are there parts of us that are still Thomas-like within us. And he was coupled with Matthew. Matthew was hated by the Jews. I mean, literally hated by the Jews. Why? Because he was a tax collector. He worked literally for the Romans. And the reason they hated tax collectors was because uh, the Romans gave them an, an, an absolute amount that needed to be collected. Give Caesar with Caesars, you've heard that. But then they could skim off of people anything else that they wanted. Anything else that they wanted. Hey, Anna, welcome on. Um, anything, they could just skim that. And so they did. And so they continually took money that didn't belong to them. Hmm. It's interesting that Matthew was a tax collector and yet he was a Jew. He was from the tribe of the Levites. He's known as Matthew the Levite. Um, and I'm sure he wondered, you know, think about this. Like this is a group Jesus is putting together. I, I would wonder, I don't know about you, but I'm sure he wondered why in the world would Jesus give Judas the money? I'm the accountant, right? For goodness sake, for God's sake, I'm the accountant, Jesus. Don't you know who you're giving the money to? Very, very interesting. Well, Thomas, uh, we know from church history that he was impaled and Matthew was beheaded. Then we come across someone named James, the son of Alphaeus. Well, because there's duplicate names, there's a distinction of who's who. And, you know, we really don't know much about him yet. Yet. For those of you out there who may be James, the son of Alpheus followers, we don't know much about him. He doesn't have his own book. He didn't, again, didn't write like Philip a book in the Bible or whatnot. Yet his name is written in the foundation stones in the city of Jerusalem. Maybe there's things he did that we will find out when we get to the other side. But I, I, I will tell you, what we do know about James, the son of Alphaeus. And maybe some of you, this applies to you. It's a quality trait. Meekness is a quality trait. That James, the son of Alphaeus, was willing to walk in obscurity for the glory of God. I, I, I just have this sensing. I have this sensing when we get to heaven, I think we're going to be pretty amazed when we get to that Bema seat Maybe some of the visible people, maybe it's not going to be quite the rewards given that some of those that walked in obscurity. You know, I know, and I'm so thankful to know some people that walk in obscurity. I know that I can call them and they won't just say, I'll pray for you. They will pray for me. And I know they pray because they will come later and say, while I was praying for you, this is what the Lord said. See, that's obscurity, but it's so very powerful and it's so very important. Pastor Louise at our drive-in church service, uh, which we have every two o'clock every Sunday at CMC, taught about prayer. He was finishing up Ephesians 6 and spoke about the different kinds of prayer and the necessity of it. And, you know, we, we get so used to that word, we kind of think it's, well, it's just something you do. But I, I'm wondering... The, the people who are intercessors, they're doing the work of the kingdom, believe me. And they're doing it when no one else is knowing it and no one else is patting them on the back and telling them how wonderful they are. But they're making a difference in the kingdom. 
and they're pulling down strongholds and they're bringing down high places and they're raising up the low places. And God honors that so very much. And so it's very interesting, this James, um, the son of Alphaeus, because tradition says that he was sawed into pieces sawed into pieces. Can you even take that in? And then we come to Judas, the son of James, also called Thaddeus in some of the um, narratives. Um, in John's gospel, John says, it was, he says it's Judas, not Iscariot. I, I found that to be interesting. He, he's being courteous enough to Judas, son of James, to clarify any confusion relational to Judas the traitor. And then we come to, to Judas Iscariot. Stole money from the church, was unsubmitted. He betrayed not just his leader, but the team that was around him. He had his own advancement in mind. He was a poor team member. He just couldn't get along with the rest. You know why? Because it was not ever about Jesus. It was about Judas. And that's why those quality traits are there. See, I, I wanna say something that I will, I will tell you is probably the, the hook, the takeaway of this message and it it's not for us to assess everybody else, it's to assess our own lives with. But the difference between the 11 and Judas Iscariot is this, the 11 had some bad days, but Judas had a bad heart. See, we all have bad days, but we're not supposed to have a bad heart. And that's the difference. While you could look like, well, why did he get, you know, this bad reputation put upon him? Reputation comes not by something that you do. It comes by a habitual pattern and a, and, and a habitual way of a lifestyle. Um, you know, you've heard bad thinking brings bad living and bad living brings bad lifestyle and bad lifestyle brings bad character and bad character will bring you a bad reputation. And see, this is the difference between the, le the 11 and Judas. The 11 had a bad day, but Judas had a bad heart. Which one are we? Which one are you? Which one are each one of us? Are, are, are we becoming are we continuing to grow or are we stuck somewhere? Remember I said in the very beginning of the message, somewhere along the line, Judas got stuck because Luke tells us who became a traitor. He wasn't meant to be a traitor. He wasn't always a traitor, but he, be, he got stuck somewhere and he wouldn't let the Lord do the work in his life, probably which meant die to his desires and his way of doing things and just become a Philip, become a Peter, become a Matthew. See, they all had bad days, but they didn't have bad hearts. Boy, that's such a, a necessary thing for us to take away here. Remember last week we said God choose, chooses us, not necessarily based on who we are right now, but on who we will become the potential that we have to become. See, it's not your doing, it's your, it's who you are. It's not what you do, it's your who, right? Let, let's think about this. Who would you change? Who would you choose? Would you have chosen any of these to change the world based on, on, on potential or based on what we see? I, I know I'm going to raise a little bit of a ruffle here, but I, I pray you're with me in the spirit right now. And, and I pray before I say this that I'm not saying a political statement right here, but I think it fits into the spiritual statement. Would you have chosen any of those 12 based on their resume? 
would it be Donald Trump you would choose? Listen, I have no doubt about Donald Trump that if he was part of the 12, his evangelism style would be get saved or get fired. I have no doubt about that. But listen, verse 12 says he prayed all night for those that he chose. In fact, Peter had a problem with John. There was problems within the, the ministry itself. John 21 says um, that Jesus said to, to Peter, it, it, in fact, I'm going to take a moment and read it. I think it's worth the time for us to read. It's a little, it's a little lengthy. Give me a little time. Um, Peter turned and saw the one, the disciple who Jesus loved, the one that he chose who was also leaning on his bosom at the supper. And he said, Lord, who is that that's going to betray you? And Peter saw him and said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? So they're having this whole betrayal thing going on at the, at the supper table. And, and, and Peter all of a sudden looks at John and probably gets a little jealous, probably was in a little competition there. And he said, what, what about this man? And you know what Jesus said to him? He said, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? What is that to you who I choose, who I see the potential in, who I see a bigger picture in? The saying went out among the brothers that this disciple would not die, but Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. He just said, if it's my will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? I, I think that's a moment right now. I'm going to tell you something. It's a moment for me right now. Part of today's message is, why don't we just do what we're called to do? Because see, Jesus said, what is that to you? What I do with him? You just follow me. And so what does it have to do with us who God puts in office? What does it have to do with us who God decides to, to uh, anoint and ordain and, and, and bring someone up to a higher level? What is that to us? Listen, I'm, I'm right there with you. You know what he said? You just follow me. Let me give it to in today's vernacular. Shut up and mind your own business and just do what I told you to do. Mm. That's a very anointed word right now. That's a very anointed word right now. If you could just stay with me just for a few more minutes, I promise. I want to read something about how bad we can read something. Okay? Because see, we think we read everything so well. But let me just share with you how bad we can read something or someone. Are you ready for this? Um, this is the uh, resume of the apostles given to a management corporation a consultant to direct someone on the hiring of these 12. And here's what it says. Thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests and we have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and our vo vocational aptitude consultant. As part of our service, we make some general comments for your guidance. Where am I at? Okay, some general comments for your assignments. Um, much as an auditor will include some general statements this is given as a result of our staff consultation and comes without any additional fee. It is the staff's opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you're undertaking. They do not have a team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of a leader. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interests above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questionable 
Thomas, Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have racial leanings, and they both register a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contracts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every best success in your venture. Sincerely, Jordan Management Consultants. Amazing how we can misread what we read. Let's, let's do ourselves a favor. Let's not, let's not judge ourselves or yourself when things are going good. May I, may, I, may I suggest something? May I pose and pitch out something to you? Evaluate yourself, not when things are going good. Evaluate yourself when you're asked to do something you don't want to do. Like now, let's do an evaluation. How mature really are we when, when we're asked to do something, when our boss asks us to do something, when we feel like, you know, this isn't fair and we're comparing ourselves to things. Are we rebellious are we, or are we submitted? Are we a team player or are we a betrayer? Do I care more about me than us? See, there's no I in team, is there? No, there isn't. See, Jesus chose these 12 after a night of prayer. I wouldn't have picked them. Would you have picked them? And may I end with saying again, the difference between the 11 and Judas is that the 11 had some bad days, but Judas had a bad heart. And don't worry. You don't have to figure all that out. Don't worry. Time always reveals the difference between the two. Time, time always reveals that. Time always reveals to ourselves who we think we are and who we really are. I, I, I wanna just end today by saying that um, I find it just so interesting that Jesus would put these teams together. And I think we learned today not only were they just ordinary blue collar workers that he had a desire to do extraordinary things through, but they had to work together in diversity. And, and, and that's my prayer. And that's, I think, one of the other takeaway points from this message. Let's work on having unity with diversity. You can work with someone with a bad day, but we can't work with someone with a bad heart. Only God can fix that. Only God can correct that. And, and should we maybe out of this message, go to the Lord and ask us and ask him to reveal to us, do we have a bad heart in some place? You know, if we do, then we're going to have a lot of bad days because a bad heart always brings a bad life. It really does. And, and I, hope, I hope this too, finally, that after... Um, learning about the 12, who they are, and what they went through. My goodness, John was the only one who wasn't martyred, and he had to suffer through an attempted uh, assassination several times. But after all that they went through and who they were in their calling to follow Jesus, I hope you're feeling better about staying in and allowing Christ to form in you new knowledge, a better understanding of his grace, and my gosh, let's mature. Let's take advantage of this time to be more grounded, to be less emotional, to be more constant, unmovable, unshakable. Because I will tell you, God has shaken everything that can be shaken in this season. Don't be one of those things. Why? Because he wants us to walk in a greater destiny and purpose when this is all over. I love you. 
I am so here for you. And I want to end by saying, for you and for us in the kingdom, the best is yet to come for us all. Amen. Continue reading through chapter six. Um, we got a lot more to go. Next, we're going to look a little bit, and I'm just going to spend some time here. We're just going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. That's an important place, one of Jesus' longest sermons, and a lot of insight into that. Um, I want to mention also to you a couple just announcements as we're closing that um, the tea has been moved to the 26th of September. Um, if you have paid for your ticket, we're, we're hoping you'd be willing to let us just scoot you over to the new date. Um, and we'll be giving you more information on that, but that's settled. Um, we also um, have drive in church every Sunday. This week, I got an important message to bring how to really read your Bible, the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. How do you know the difference in, and does the Old Covenant really not matter? Or should we only read the New Testament? I believe I'm gonna to help to refine your Bible study skills and being able to take hold of uh, the grace message that, that we live as New Covenant believers. Um, your giving can be done online through covenantmessiah.com. There's a link there for donate. You can give through um, texting, which I've given that address over and over. Um, you can send it in the mail to P.O. Box 5680, Deptford, New Jersey, 08096. I'll repeat that. Uh, write CMC, P.O. Box 5680, Deptford, 08096. Um, and I should not end this without just expressing my stunned and amazed and thankful heart for those of you who have continued to bless this ministry, bless the Bible study, bless all that we do, and um, just your giving has been astounding, and I am just so very thankful for every one of you. And this isn't the time to stop giving. You know, I'm not someone who likes to speak a lot about those kind of things, but um, you know, if you're having financial problems, this is not the time to stop giving. This is the time to put God first so all these things can be added to you. Amen. I love you. Um, Sunday, 2 o'clock in the parking lot, we meet. And then next Tuesday, we will continue down the road. I feel like I'm forgetting another announcement. Uh, down the road of continuing in Luke 6. Some of you have asked about the bus trip. Um, we do have um, no cancellation as of yet, and um, we're looking to an alternate date just in case it does cancel or it does get postponed. But please, I just ask that um, it's almost time to make the final payment. So if you haven't sent your deposit, I'd appreciate if you would do that um, so that we can you know, know exactly what the situation is with going to that trip. Um, we, I should mention this also, our trip to Paul's Journeys and Israel next October is still on. The good news is they have postponed our final payment to the end of June. So, you know, those of you who had a little inquiry or a little bit of a tug there to go, um, it's still, still available for you to do that. And I love you. Thanks for all your prayer for our baby girl. Um, we're so excited for Davy Love. Just, you should see Hadley. She is so excited to just, they sang happy birthday to her. And, oh, you know what? Life is just wonderful. I know we're going through a little hiccup here, but you know what? My cup runneth over, and that's my profession. And so there's that's my reality, and I pray it's yours too. I love you. Have a wonderful, amazing day. Take this message. Take it apart. Go to the Lord. Which disciple are you? And what does he have in store for you? What's your destiny? Because he's got one. Amen. Love you. And goodbye.